thanks so much for that introduction. Um, for, there's a PowerPoint illustrated lecture that follows, but some introductory remarks. Uh, yes, it's like the medical profession. I have a specialty. It's immigration and ethnicity. So today I'm sort of playing your family doctor, and I'm going to diagnose the history of philanthropy. But you will see that I tend to look at it from my perspective of diversity and immigration in Cleveland. It's an interesting, important topic. Uh, there are people far more expert in it than I am. I will admit my colleague David Hammock at Case Western Reserve University uh, is the doyen of foundation and philanthropic history. And his article in the Encyclopedia of Cleveland History on Philanthropy is a, a must-see. You can check up on me by reading it afterwards. Uh, there is on the website for the Western Reserve Historical Society, and I'll show you a uh, URL for that at the end of the sh uh, program. Show. It is entertainment, isn't it? Uh, at the end of the program for a historical timeline of philanthropy in Cleveland, which our archivist, uh, philanthropic archivist put together. And I think that's absolutely extraordinary. Why am I talking about this? Well, A, I was asked, but B, I have a vested interest in philanthropy. I work for two institutions, both of which are not for profits. My entire life has been supported by other people's money. <laughs> Seriously. I went to college by virtue of a National Merit Scholarship. That was somebody else's money. Uh, got me through Case Western Reserve University. Government philanthropy in form of an NDA fellowship got me through graduate school. And I've been employed at the Western Reserve Historical Society for longer than you, I want to tell you. And that is an institution that is supported by philanthropy, as is Case Western Reserve University. And the position I hold is an endowed position, endowed by the late Warner D. Mueller and Nora Krieger. Uh, I owe a great deal to people who part with their money willingly for good causes. And I'm going to open this, this discussion of how, why Cleveland may be special philanthropically or may not be, uh, how it, mostly how it came to be philanthropically, with, with a uh, comment on a program I watched on television last night. I don't know how many of you are PBS junkies, but it was Rockefeller Night on WVIZ. And, and of course, there was a lot about John D. Rockefeller's philanthropic interest, but the question always comes up is, why did he give money away? Did, did he give it away because it was a religious imperative? Uh, did he give it away because he felt guilty for the way he had conducted business? Was he, i.e., buying his way into the afterlife? Why are people philanthropic? Think about that when we're discussing this. Why, why do they support things? And when you're thinking about this, remember the period I'm talking about today is mostly going to be focused from the beginning of Cleveland to the 1920s with the little coda at the end. The charitable deduction for phil philanthropic giving on your IRS form appeared only in 1917. Income tax appeared in 1913. Why did the charitable deduction appear in 1917? A, because taxes had gone up that year because of the war. B, because the government was afraid that the increased tax burden on some people would make them less willing to give to charities which were growing during the war. So that came in. So there's a, there are a lot of wheels turning in this discussion. But the biggest wheel for me is the diverse nature of our city. And some really, you know, what do we consider as philanthropy? Um, Almost every religion, every religion that I know, I don't know them all, has some coda, whether it's tzedakah, whether it is charity, whether it is stewardship, what I'll be talking about, about how people should behave as believers in that religion. So people donate because of religious reasons, and they also donate to their religious entities. Philanthropy is also given to culture and education. Voila. Here I am. Here is the Maltz Museum. Milton Tamara Maltz. Social needs, United Way. Uh, federations drive every year. What does that support? Where does United Way come from? We're going to talk about the United Way. And causes. You know, we give money to causes. Uh, causes can be somebody's election, right? Uh, the cause can be animal welfare. So there are a number of reasons for us to part with that which we have earned or come into. It all starts with the origins of Cleveland. Uh, I, I like this picture. This is Public Square. 
The casino is over here, right? Okay. <laughs> now, the thing that amazes me, the little departure here to keep everybody interested, the church I'm going to talk about, First Presbyterian, which you know is Old Stone Church, is over there. And it is in that church and other Protestant churches that stewardship is prominent. Now, the church over there would really be, the founders would be aghast at a casino across the square from them. <laughs> that aside, uh, Cleveland was founded mainly by people from New England. Moses Cleveland was a New Englander from Connecticut. Uh, his surveyors shared the same background. They were almost all Protestant. The early settlers who came in were largely New England, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut. And they came with, uh, with a long-standing concept of what the Puritans would call stewardship. They came with a Puritan, long-standing Puritan identity. If you want to learn a little bit more about that, and if you're not afraid of large books, <laughs> Diana Tittle's book on the severances is a must-read because she essentially traces the roots of that family and their philanthropic and charitable impulses back to the early settlers who came to New England in the 1600s. So that carries on. It's palpable when it comes to Cleveland. That's why we have a public square in which all the civic organizations were arrayed along and the church was prominent in it. So taking care of your community. Of course, that community then was Protestant. Some of the early people who came in, these are two of my favorite figures. They came in the 1830s. They didn't happen to be Congregationalists or Presbyterians. They were Baptists. Uh, this is Benjamin Rouse and his wife, Rebecca Rouse. They came as missionaries to Cleveland in the 1830s. Uh, they were spreading the gospel. Uh, they were a little concerned as other people were because Cleveland was a lake port and uh, lake sailors behaved badly. And they established missions for the lake sailors. Uh, they started the first Baptist church and they went on for careers, particularly Rebecca Rouse, that are extraordinary in terms of giving back to the community. She was one of the founders of what became today's uh, Beachbrook uh, Protestant Orphan Asylum. She was also the woman who, during the Civil War, organized Cleveland women as part of the Sanitary Commission to get books, raise, get blankets, get food, get support, find jobs for veterans for the Civil War soldiers. So she was there, and I think it's genetic because you may know her granddaughter, or her, have heard of her granddaughter. Her granddaughter was Adela Prentice Hughes, the founder of the Musical Arts Association, whose impulse was to bring culture and good music to Cleveland, and who had an incredible ability to get wealthy Clevelanders to part with their money to establish an orchestra. So this is this initial antebellum philanthropic area. What were they giving to? What were they looking at? By the way, the lecture is given to you by courtesy of Benadryl, so that's why there's a lot of water here. Uh, they were, the antebellum community was looking for moral guidance, giving to causes to put people on the straight and narrow path, whether it was drunken sailors, whether it was fallen women, who took care of the sick. Now, we're not going to get into present politics on that, but there, there were city infirmaries, but other people took care of the sick. Who took care of the orphans? If you read the Severance book, orphans were usually placed with relatives to begin with, but as the city grew, that became impossible, so orphanages would be started. And then education was a major aspect of antebellum philanthropy. The public school system being publicly supported, but special schools, the ragged school for lonely children or wayward children, if you want to use the term, were established at that point. So this is there. there. I could add temperance and other causes. That's where people gave their time and their money. And it's all based on this foundation, Presbyterians and Congregationalists. And people who have heard me speak before know my wife always serves as a foil. Okay. I'm a lapsed Catholic, so I can speak about Catholics. She's Congregationalist. Her family goes way back. And the, the wedding story is another lecture. <laughs> but this was the core of the community, and, and this is the core of New England. And then that is added to as immigrants come in, German Lutherans, uh, German Methodists, and other Methodists come, Baptists uh, from the East Coast, Episcopalians. So you have this Protestant aspect of philanthropic giving. And then you get to new things. So this is stewardship. This is charity. Catholics begin arriving in the city in the late 1820s. By 1847, there is a diocese of Cleveland created. 
And you can see as we go along that there are little branches that go out. And in 1839, from Unsleben in Bavaria, the first organized group of Jewish settlers come. Thanks to the invitation of Simpson Thorman, I'm looking at a descendant here in the, in the seats. Uh, and they come with Sedeka, long-standing concept. So there are three strains in this increasingly prosperous city. Uh, city, how prosperous? Well, it's numbers time. 606 people in 1820. 3,000 plus in 1830. By 1860, it is 40,000 40, people here. And by 1920, where I'm going to sort of close this off, it's nearly 800,000 people. And they're not all Protestant, they're not all Catholic, and they're not all Jewish. They're immigrants. Look at the numbers. This is the diversity of Cleveland's philanthropic. This, this underlies everything. So this. So if you're looking at this, you know, there may be some people who are Protestant, some Jewish, some Catholic, but the, the old system's not going to hold up for everyone. By 1877, Cleveland does not look like New England anymore. It is a sprawling industrial city with about 120,000 people. The mill smoke is in the background. The river is there on the west side, east side. Uh, divisions geographically, divisions culturally, divisions religiously. And as Cleveland industrializes, the needs of the cities change. This is the industrial landscape. We're going to look at some needs here in a second. Um, this is 1888. This is Kingsbury Run in the Flats. This is Rockefeller's number one oil refinery. So as the city industrializes, there are different issues to deal with. Deaths and maiming in, on railroads, in businesses, in industries. Uh, how do you take care of people who are hurt on the job? How do you take care of people who are unemployed in an era when constant employment was not the norm? Where is the social safety net? How do you deal with housing? This is 1905. This is on the edge of the flats. It's a home for five families. Picture taken by the founder of Hiram House Social Settlement, George Bellamy. So you have issues arising that Protestant founders could never have envisioned. It's a growing concern. This era, which creates these issues, also creates vast amounts of wealth. This is famous old Euclid Avenue, a snapshot of it. Uh, this is the Samuel Mather House. This was post-1906. This is Euclid Avenue. You're looking at the CSU campus today. This is 40th and Euclid, just across the street from the uh, Jane Hunter uh, Social Service Center. This is Sylvester Everett's home. Huge amounts of money are being made in the city. There is no income tax. There is a tradition of stewardship. There are problems. How do you solve them? Time out for a little cute story. You want a little interpolation? Uh, Sylvester Everett built this house, and he, he designed a room. He married the girl across the street. Her name was Alice Wade. She was the daughter of Jephthah Homer Wade. And Sylvester had been married before his first wife died. And, and Alice had, had some issues. Uh, she was deathly afraid of noises. So when Sylvester Everett had Charles Schweinfurth design this house, he put a room in the center that had only a door and no windows. And that's where Alice would hide during thunderstorms. So money to, to use for that. And people who made money began to give back to the community in different ways. Parklands. Now we look at parklands and say, well, you know, why would you give parks when people are dying in factories? Why would you give parks uh, when people are jobless? For a variety of reasons, the city was dirty and smoky, and people felt that getting out to the countryside, a la Hiram House Camp, was a way to refresh oneself and learn about a different style of life and to improve oneself. So Wade built his own park out the east side of Cleveland along the Donebrook Valley, Wade Park, he opened it up to the public on Sundays in the 1870s, then he gave part of it to the city in the 1880s. This is the lagoon, the centaur fountain, this is 1888. The art museum would be built here. So the city now had a park on the periphery, in parkland. Well, then two other people decided to provide parks. Now this all holds together. Mr. Gordon had a private estate on the lakefront where Doan Brook emptied into the lake. That was Mr. Gordon's park, which he gave 
to the city. And it became a place to get away and bathe in the summer. Now, if you're going to do the history of Jewish Glenville and you talk to people who were around for a while, Gordon Park's going to resonate because that's where you went to cool off. That's where you went to swim in the lake. And then the two areas between Gordon Park, the area between Gordon Park and Wade Park, were knitted together in 1896 for the city's centennial by John D. Rockefeller's gift. He bought the land between them. That is Rockefeller Park. My colleague, Sean Martin, who is somewhere in the audience, in the back row, did an extraordinary uh, short pamphlet, uh, History of the Jewish Community and Rockefeller Park and the role it played for that community. So although I might belittle Parks as philanthropic gifts, they still played roles for people and they remember them fondly. So that's Rockefeller's gift and Gordon's gift, but the problems are deeper. <sighs> Education. This is Amos Stone. His name's going to come up at the end of this talk again, as is the name of uh, his daughter's husband. Well, we'll meet him sooner rather than later, Samuel Mather. And it was Amundsen Stone who made a fortune in railroad building, who gave the money to convince Western Reserve College to move from its detached campus in Hudson, Ohio, to what is now University Circle in the 1880s. It was $500,000. That is no small sum of money for that time, particularly when you would think that a worker at that point is earning maybe three to four hundred dollars a year. And so that cements the cultural infrastructure of Cleveland, which we look at today, or the educational infrastructure, which we look at today as part of our future as a community. Uh, side story about this, there, there have been many pleas to bring the university to Cleveland, which is a much bigger city than Hudson, Ohio, or the college to Cleveland. And there was a lot of pushback because the trustees didn't want the young men exposed to the evils of the lakefront city. Billiard parlors, saloons, prostitutes, and so forth. University Circle, as we now know it, was a safe place. Uh, go to Uptown and frequent the saloons there now, please. <laughs> now we get into more personal philanthropy. These are the Mathers. Uh, recommended book on flora. Mather, Flora Stone Mather, is Gladys Haddad's book on Flora Stone Mather, Mather Daughter of the Western Reserve. It, it is a real exploration of the impetus for her personal philanthropy. And she married Samuel Mather. Now, I love this picture of Samuel, natty. Uh, you can't see his socks clearly, but they're not what you would expect Sam Mather to wear. They're really spiff. And they are prominent. How, how many of you do not know the name Mather? How many of you have not seen the name Mather on a building someplace? Be honest, we've all seen it, right? Their philanthropies were extraordinary. Her gifts to the College of Women at Case Western, what is now Case Western Reserve University, created what became Mather College, uh, uh, and that is now folded into the uh, full university. Her gifts also helped support Goodrich House Social Settlement, which we will see. Sam Mather's gifts, Lakeside Hospital, University Hospital, uh, Western Reserve University, Western Reserve Historical Society, Hiram House Social Settlement. He was on more boards of trustees than you can imagine. His, his day planner was incredible. So what did they start? Well, Goodrich House Social Settlement, and, and this is the old Marine Hospital, which would become the first building for Lakeside Hospital. Social Settlements. They are a progressive era response to the increasing crowding, despair, and urban problems in cities like Cleveland. Social settlement movement is, began in England with Toynbee House. It came to the United States most prominently in Hull House in Chicago. We all know Hull House and Jane Addams. It appeared in Cleveland in 1896 simultaneously with the establishment of Goodrich House, which was then behind what is now Old Stone Church which was the Mather Family Church, and then later with Hiram House. So the social settlements were incredible in that young people who were imbued, idealistic, wanted to do something about the conditions of poverty and deep privilege, if you will, in American cities, gave up their lives, so to speak, and went and worked in those cities. They established settlement houses, lived in the settlement houses. They taught English. They taught mathematics. They taught immigrants to appreciate good art. They taught European women how to cook American dishes. 
right? Okay, this, that's another story in itself. And, and those lived down. I, I equate them to neighborhood centers. By the 1920s, Cleveland had at least 18 social settlements. One of the settlements, which is right now just over there, it's called the JCC. Started out as the Consul Educational Alliance. It was established in the same Lower Woodland Avenue neighborhood as Hiram House. It was established by the existing Jewish community to serve the thousands of Jews who were coming in after the pogroms in Eastern Europe. And so the, the story of uh, Consul Educational Alliance is really interesting. I find it fascinating because when it was established, its operating hours were Monday through Saturday. I think about that. Uh, they soon learned that, that Saturday wasn't a good day to be open in the Lower Woodland neighborhood and they shifted their hours to Monday through Friday and they hired a Yiddish speaking worker named Isaac Spektorsky. So that's the settlement movement. The hospital movement, which is a huge part of our economy now, Lakeside Hospital uh, again starts in the old U.S. Federal Hospital, the Marine Hospital, which has created the surf sailors on Lakeside, it was on Lakeside. Eventually it moves to University Circle and one of the prime movers in that was Samuel Mather in getting the hospital moved. If you look at the history of ba Rainbow Babies and Children's, if you look at the history of Lakeside Hospital, University Hospitals, names of all sorts of Cleveland families are there. So that's what's being established. There are other hospitals that are being established though, and this is where we begin to bifurcate and trifurcate. Mount Sinai and St. Vincent. Catholic Hospital, why Catholic Hospital? in some ways for fear that the Catholics might be proselytized in Protestant hospitals. Why a Jewish hospital? Jewish physicians couldn't get privileges in Gentile hospitals. And if you were a patient who kept kosher, it was pretty hard to get a kosher meal in a place like Lakeside at that time. So there's Mount Sinai. This is the interior of St. Vincent's Hospital. So you're beginning to get parallel philanthropic universes. And even the social settlements begin to be parallel in different directions. So we talked about a Jewish social settlement. Here's the Italian settlement, Alta House, funded by John D. Rockefeller and named after his daughter. And this is Caramu House, Playhouse Settlement, established by Russell and Ruby Najelov. And they began to serve the African-American community as blacks began to come in Cleveland. But it was an integrated uh, biracial settlement that, that is one of the true landmarks of Cleveland history. They're still around. They still survive. So let's look at these divisions. These are just some. Again, if you look at that timeline at Western Reserve, okay, Amos is still in home for pro aged Protestant gentlewomen. That's what its name was. Catholic Little Sisters of the Poor. The Altenheim for Germans. Montefiore for Jews. Menorah Park for Orthodox Jews. It started in 1906. The Eliza Bryant home for African Americans. There was a Welsh home for the aged and a Scottish home for the aged. It's all over the place. Orphanages, Cleveland Protestant Orphan Asylum, the Catholics and the Jewish Orphan Asylum, all being supported by their particular communities. So at the turn of the century, these are meeting some of the needs, but the other needs, as I hinted earlier, our unemployed, indigent, healthcare, maternal, factory, environmental issues, housing, education, public, private education, and cultural competition. When I say cultural competition, it's the turn of the century in Cleveland. And Cleveland looks down to Cincinnati because Cincinnati has, you know, more so than Pittsburgh, has always been Cleveland's rival. And Cleveland is proud because it is now bigger than Cincinnati in 1900, but it still doesn't have an art museum. It still doesn't have an orchestra. And Cincinnati does. Okay. Today we play that out with, you know, do we have a major league team? And do they have a major league team? Uh, this picture is wonderful. This is uh, Lower Woodland Avenue. It's Big Italy. This is the housing conditions in the Palumbo backyard. How do you deal with these problems? Well, philanthrop philanthropic giving and new philosophies that arise in the progressive period of American history. This is a man named Frederick W. Taylor. He's not a philanthropist, so far as I know. Frederick W. Taylor was the father of scientific management, of time study, of rationalizing the production of factory goods, of making things orderly. And if I would recommend a book for you on this whole period, which I find fascinating, you may find deadly boring, it's by a man named Robert Wiebe. It's an older book called Search for Order. 
And Wiebe's discussion is in the late 19th century, the United States was fragmented geographically. It was fragmented in a number of ways. And there were all sorts of movements to try to create order in this somewhat chaotic society. And some of the order we, get, we take for granted, like time zones. The railroads needed time zones to create order. Frederick W. Taylor looks at factory production, the most famous story here. And it, it's, it's about watching people shovel coal at a steel mill in Pittsburgh. And, and he's looking at this and he says, well, there's a lot of wasted effort there because they're using the same shovel for coke, for lime, and for iron ore. And so he calculated that the ideal weight that a man could lift and not hurt himself and work more vigorously was 32 pounds per shovelful. He invented different shovels to meet those weights, and voila, production increased and jobs decreased. And this is an assembly line at the Winton Motor Carriage Factory, so why not take those things and apply them to charity, right? That seems logical. Or does that seem antithetical to what we feel is the concept of charity? Part of the progressive mentality, you've got that going on one hand. On the other hand, you have leaders like Tom L. Johnson, the progressive mayor of Cleveland, his acolyte and follower, uh, Newton D. Baker. And, and they are part of the progressive movement that's looking at American society and saying we have social, cultural problems. Cities are growing improperly. We need to create order. We need to create what we would call a social safety net. We need to create a rational way to treat these problems. And in steps this man, Martin Marx. I think he's a catalyst. He's a Jewish businessman. He's in clothing, insurance, and banker. He's a trustee of the Jewish Orphan Home, and he's a member of the Chamber of Commerce at the turn of the 20th century. Now, why is he important? Well, in the Chamber of Commerce, they are, they are the agency in Cleveland that really has the power at that point. And, and they're beginning to do things like getting the city to pass housing codes to rationalize housing, getting the city to build bathhouses to serve neighborhoods that didn't have indoor plumbing or showers. And, and Marx, and they're also concerned with charity because many of the members of the Chamber of Commerce are saying, my God, everybody's knocking on my door asking for a handout. How do I know which charity I should give to? So Marx and his colleagues create what's called the Committee on Benevolent Associations. I get paid to remember these things. Okay. <laughs> And the Committee on Benevolent Associations does what progressives do. They survey all the organizations in Cleveland and try to find which ones are worthy. Now, that's a subjective thing, isn't it? Which ones are worthy? And they, they send out a list of charities that you should give to. Now, keep that organization in mind. Martin Marx is also part, he's one of the founders of the Jewish Community Federation. That's an organization, isn't it? He, along with Charles Eisenman, take this organization, rationalization aspect of, okay, let, let's get the whole community involved. Let's, let's select the organizations that need support. Let's have an organized, advertised fund drive to build support from this. This is very progressive. So he and Eisenman are among, uh, I think, the nine founders of what is now the Jewish Federation of Cleveland in 1903. It is the first or one of the first, there's some argument about Denver. And, and this sets a model. It is the community saying, this is how we will meet our needs. We're going to do it in an organized, rational way. And I can't emphasize that more than, than, than I'm doing right now. It is terribly important because it sets a number of things in motion. The other thing that's important about Charles Eisenman is the highest award you can re re receive from Federation today is the Eisenman Award. And, and it, it is about people who do good for the entire community. Because Eisenman's view, even though he helped establish the Federation to work within the Jewish community, was that everybody should support the entire community. His concept of philanthropy was broad. It was organized, it was progressive, but it was still broad and looked at the entire community. So there, this is one of the things, if we're sending the Moss Museum and, and talking about philanthropy in the Jewish community. These are important figures. And so what is this? This all comes in motion. In 1880, the Charity Organization Society is created in Cleveland. Charity organ well, they start things like casework. You know, you just, no longer can you go knock on your door and say, well, you, you look like you're in need. Casework, well, well, you know, what do you need? We'll write this down and we'll, we'll rationalize this and we'll, we'll work out a plan for you. And we'll come back and investigate you and see how you're doing. So this becomes the Associated Charities is established in 1900 in Cleveland. The Committee of Benevolent Associations, 1903 Federation. 1913, 
100 years ago this year, Federation for Charity and Philanthropy, which gives birth to what was the Welfare Federation, what is United Way today. And again, this, this is modeled on this. It carries through. 1915, this is now the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. Here you take philanthropy, stewardship, whatever else, and you say, we need to teach this. And some old-time charitable workers said, you can't teach people to be charitable. You, know, you can't teach it. It's something that comes from within. That's an argument that some people will still debate. And then the Catholics get into the act with the Catholic Charities uh, Corporation in 1919. So you've got three groups, and they're, they're all organized. And that's where we are today in many ways, except for this guy. I like him. Frederick Goff. He's a lawyer. Came from Illinois, if I remember correctly. A uh, lawyer in Cleveland. Uh, he had a uh, very, very lucrative practice, and he, he gave it up to become the head of a relatively new bank, the Cleveland Trust Company. And well, at the Cleveland Trust Company, he was looking at another form of giving, trust, charitable trust, and, and he was concerned with something that Sir Arthur Hobhouse was concerned with, called the dead hand of the past. Funds or endowments that were created to support, you know, left-handed boot blacks who are out of work. You know, when there are no left-handed boot blacks out of work, what do you do with the money? Uh, endowments to create horse troughs along Euclid Avenue or some other street. Those would go past. So his, his, his concern was, well, how do we deal with this and rationalize it and, and make it useful to the entire community? And voila, he comes up with something called the community trust idea, the Cleveland Foundation. Now, this one we can definitely say is the first, and it is a model for ones in New York and elsewhere. There are similar organizations. There are thousands of them all over the world now. Not all of them are directly descended from this idea, but this is Goff's idea. And when Goff first creates the Cleveland Foundation, time out for a book recommendation, Diana Tittle's History of the Cleveland Foundation, it takes it up to the 1980s. You need to read that. It's really quite good. Uh, okay, that commercial is over. Uh, what Goff first does, he, he, creates a, he creates a board of governors for the foundation that, that is drawn from various banks. And somebody at one of the Cleveland newspapers said, well, that's not a good idea, and talks to Goff's wife, Frances Southworth Goff, and, and says, that, you know, you need to have public representation in this. And so it becomes the public private board that we know today, the distribution board in the Cleveland Foundation. He does it just in time because Goff is called into a hearing in Washington, D.C. This gets long and complex, but it's the Rockefeller things in my mind. John D. Rockefeller II is in trouble because Rockefeller owns Colorado Fuel and Iron, at which in Ludlow there has been a bloody massacre of striking workers. John D. Jr. is called into a hearing in Washington and has to explain this away and talks about you know, the Rockefeller Foundations, the Rockefeller Trust, and you know, somebody says, well, that's all governed by one person. And Goff is put on the stand, and Goff says, well, we have a foundation that, that is a public-private. There are a number of voices about how this is shared. Ask anybody how important this concept is, is look at Playhouse Square today, look at Cleveland's Lakefront Rehabilitation, look at the school work that's being done through the Cleveland Foundation, look at the amount of money that people give to the Cleveland Foundation. So that, that is seminal. I really like this because his, his secretary is a guy named Ralph Hayes. And, and Ralph Hayes goes from Cleveland to New York and he starts the New York Community Trust. So it's a guy from Cleveland who starts in New York. I always like to be in New York, uh, particularly the Yankees. Um, keep dreaming this year, John. The, um, so, and then that's where it's from there. Hayes, Hayes, by the way, one of the reasons you have a good time at the Western Reserve Historical Society Research Library is when Ralph Hayes gave us his papers, he left a huge trust fund for us in Delaware. Diversity and order. Since the ordering of philanthropy in Cleveland in the early 1900s, I'll read this for you, the city and region have evolved a system that supports particularity of purpose, focus, but still has maintained overall goals for the community and culture, education, social service. I will argue that there are still particular fo foci that we all give to. But over this are a set of priorities, sometimes fairly loose, that determine where things are going. Community shares is an alternative pr priority to United Way. But there are priorities set in different ways, and the one I work in is a priority. 
people decided that University Circle was going to be a cultural center. But each of the places in University Circle can look to different donors that actually created them. The Art Museum looks to Huntington and Wade and Trust. Case School of Applied Science uh, there can look to Leonard Case early on. Amos of Stone here at the other part. So it's University Circle. You've got those two. Let's carry it on. John Long Severance, whose money came in large part from Rockefeller, uh, breaking ground for several. $2 million donation promised at the beginning of the Great Depression. His stock portfolio collapsed, but he still paid the whole thing. Samuel Mather dies during the Depression, and his, his bequest can't be met because his portfolio has died. But yet, you see these particular features here, people and the art museum. And I'm sort of looking at things. Okay, so you have the bequest that, that give the land and build the building. And then you have one of my favorite characters here. This is Leonard Hanna Jr. The nephew of Mark Hanna, the political kingmaker, uh, and an art lover, a friend of Bill Milliken, the director of the Cleveland Museum of Art. And not only did he buy numerous Boku artworks, for the art museum, he left them $40 million in his will when he passed away in the 1950s. Now, don't quote me on this. This is not sour grapes. I find it interesting. Uh, the Historical Society has Leonard Hanna Jr.'s mother's house, and the art museum has his money. <laughs> it's, um, it's looking at this. Then there are people apart. This is a conflicted story of philanthropy. Do you know this building at 40th and Cedar? Uh, it's the Phyllis Wheatley Center. Do you know this young lady? And Jane Edna Hunter. Jane Edna Hunter came to Cleveland as part of the great migration of African Americans late 19th, early 20th century. And she was a trained nurse. And she was able to get positions, a position with somebody on Euclid Avenue. But what she was looking at was young black women coming to Cleveland with no place to stay and being preyed upon or in fear of being preyed upon. And so she wanted to provide a safe haven for them. Now the historical argument is that there was a YWCA in Cleveland at that point, but would it accept black women? Uh, and, and that question is open. And so she decided she was going to start the Phyllis Wheatley Association for young black women. And the funding for this came from many white patrons. So the argument, the argument is really kind of interesting. The argument is, did she sell out or didn't she sell out? It's a great dissert, uh, not dissertation of thesis that's done by a student at Case West Reserve, Michael Metzner, about the, the conflict that was going on between the older black community in Cleveland and young, new, educated blacks who were coming in and were pushing again, were, were debating separate, not separate but equal, but separate institutions. Met, Metzner's work is worth reading. So she makes the decision, and this, this is designed by Habel and Benish the architects for the Wade family. So this, this, is, this is an enormous thing, and, and it is there today. It is celebrated its 100th anniversary. So there are these issues of separateness there. The Cedar YMCA was the black branch of the YMCA. Julius Rosenthal of Sears uh, was one of the great proponents of giving money to African Americans for social institutions around the country. And sometimes that was argued about because the community would want a separate institution. So he was caught in this. Well, we leave out something that's really prominent now, and I'm going to get into politics a little bit. What role does the government have in all of this? What role should the government have in charity and philanthropy? You can read this as well as I can, but when the Depression hit, people like Sam Mather in the 1920s were proud to say that Cleveland can take care of its own. When the Depression hit, it was beyond the means of the private charities. So the state came in and federal programs came in. And they went beyond just simply giving jobs or, or providing relief. You know, essentially before this, what the city gave out was, was uh, poor relief, was basically coal and food. But then you begin to see, center, it goes into the creation of art and music, the WPA. Uh, 
writing of history. There are great histories of Cleveland written by the WPA that have yet to be published. Uh, the encouragement of historical preservation, expansion, and enhancement of parklands. This, this is all stuff that private philanthropy was supposed to be doing. Now, I haven't studied this deeply enough, but I get a sense that when the Depression was over and Cleveland was on the rebound in the late in the 40s after the war, that there was much unhappiness, and they, want, they wanted to recapture the privatization, but it had gone to the point where that could never be recaptured. And here's where you should read the article I did for Mike Barrett, the Teaching Cleveland website on philanthropy in Cleveland, because it discusses this period of transition. So this is this part of what we still argue about today. Should the federal government have a national endowment for the arts? Should the federal government have a national endowment for the humanities? What's the role of government in this? Should it all be private? Uh, but this was a strong pushback in Cleveland because we had gotten this so far together. 1947, no, it's 49, I think. 47 or 49, the tax law has changed. I'm not a tax lawyer. Ask my accountant. Uh, and the tax law at this time makes something more favorable than it's ever been before. It's called the private foundation. <coughs> And the article I've written will show you the numbers of private foundations that are established between 49, 54, and beyond. And there are hundreds of them in Cleveland today. And you work, if you work for a not-for-profit organization in Cleveland, you know the names of the foundations. You know what their interests are. And all those can come out of another tax change. CODA. As I said, we still, you know, Cleveland Foundation is there. Community Chest is still there. Center for Community Solutions, which is the old Welfare Federation, is still there. We've changed names. There's still slightly different focus. But what I find interesting is despite that, there are a lot of players. And I have some old pictures here. Charity and philanthropy. I'm going to take you for a walk down Euclid Avenue when we close this. Leonard and Albert Ratner, Monte Ahucha. New people coming into Cleveland. Not Jewish, not Catholic, not Protestant, maybe Hindu, maybe Muslim, giving back. Huja Medical Center around the corner. I think that stewardship tradition co continues. The question is, does it continue because that's what you do when you're in Cleveland, or is it a competition issue? Why do you give more faces? Uh, this is an old one. Uh, this is Alonzo Wright. Cleveland's first black millionaire. And do you, does anybody know who his pump jockey is? It's Jesse Owens. Now Wright and the black community, and this leads me to a point that I've not talked about, every community has an internal system. Every church, every synagogue, every temple, every mosque, every ethnic fraternal association, has a support mechanism built into it. They raise funds to help people. Ethnic fraternal, if it's a Landsmannschaft in the Jewish community, it's basically raising money to help people from that particular community. If it's the Slovenian Progressive Women's Association, it brings women together, but they buy insurance and death benefits. Uh, during times of the community, there are subcategories of these little systems in every community. And so within the black community, you, you have that as well in the churches. And today, if you want to look at black philanthropy in and outside of the community, you look at the United Black Fund, or one looks at place, uh, Tots and Teens, the uh, black uh, sororities, the links, all organizations that raise money to do good in the community and go beyond the community. So that's, uh, this is Umberto Fideli. Fidelity Insurance Company. And Umberto Fidelli, it's, there's an endowed chair in Italian studies at John Carroll University. So we now have Jewish, Asian Indian, African American, Italian, Grabowski had to do Stefanski. <laughs> Savings loan, third federal, his son Mark Stefanski, the third federal foundation, giving back to the neighborhood, anchoring, trying to rebuild Broadway but active beyond that. And Iris and Bert Wolstein. So this, there's this, as the community changes, people come into it. So back to my first question is why? But if I ignore the why, the one thing I look at is the result. And let me take you down Euclid Avenue. 
for a little trip, and then we can, may have some time for questions here. We'll start at Public Square, not at the casino. That's not a charitable institution. <laughs> we'll start at Old Stone Church, and we'll go inside the church, and we will see the great stained glass window, I think it's by Lafarge, that honors Amos' stone as a supporter of the church and as a charitable individual. Bingo, there's stewardship, there's Old Cleveland, you're on Public Square. We'll go down Euclid Avenue, and, and we'll stop, let's say, at Playhouse Square. And, and at Playhouse Square, we'll look left, and we'll look at the theaters at Playhouse Square, and say, wow, how did those survive? It's Ray Shepardson, Junior League, individuals, the Cuyahoga County government, as well as the Cleveland Foundation. When the Cleveland Foundation put money into that venture, it solidified and took. Then you just need to look to the other side of the old Hanna building, go up a few floors, and you're at the Cleveland Foundation headquarters. It's a little charitable trip. Oh, then you go to CSU campus and you see the Levin School of Urban Studies. There's Levin School of Urban Studies out there. You go past that, and then there's the Ahuja Center. Okay, let's keep going east on, on University Circle. Let's see if I can find my, my places and so forth. We'll, we'll go past the Agora. We won't stop there unless there's a good concert. And uh, move into uh, Cleveland Clinic territory. And, and you begin to see all sorts of names on Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Miller are there. Uh, past Cleveland Clinic, you will go to, I, I think it's, uh, oh, I forget what it does, but it's a Wolstein charity. It's named after Wolstein. You go past that. You go past Wolstein, you're at 105th Street, and you're looking at the William O. Walker in State Bill, but it's named after William O. Walker, a black editor, not a philanthropist, but in his honor. And, and then, you're, then you're into the Valhalla of names and buildings. You're in University Circle. And that's what fascinates me, because I've worked in University Circle for my entire adult life, thanks to chari charity and philanthropy. And so I, will look at the, I used to look at the buildings, and I would find you know, Mather, and there's a Rockefeller building there. Uh, Harkness Chapel, there's more, you know, there's more Rockefeller money there. Oh, there's another Mather. I have my, my offices in Mather House. It's eternally confusing, because there's a Mather Memorial building and first-year students can never find me because they're in the wrong building. So there's, there's Mather and whatever else, but, but then across from Mather Memorial Building, diagonally, there's, there's the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. And then across the street from the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences, the Peter B. Lewis Building. Okay, where am I going with this, ladies and gentlemen? I'll go back to Euclid Avenue, and at the University Hospital campus, there's the Seidman Center. I go up to Seidman Center, go up Cornell Road. I'm walking home. I live just past there, and I go past another Wolstein structure, the research center. And I look to the, and I'm going past Wolstein. I turn this way, and I see the, the Mather Pavilion and the Lerner Tower over it. This tradition, whatever the names are there for, of giving, whatever the reason is there for, has been rationalized, has been organized, but it is still peculiarly individualistic. And no matter where it comes from, the future of this city, as we know it now, if I'm believing the prognosticators, which is educational research and medicine, and culture and tourism, is built on philanthropy. And that's why I love it. I'll leave you with that, and there's the, these are the readings. Dave Hammock's Philanthropy in the Encyclopedia. He's done a book on American Foundations with Helmut K. Onhire. And this timeline is just, it's a killer. So, you know, if there's an organization I haven't mentioned, I haven't done so because you can find it on Margaret Brzezinski Bay's timeline of Cleveland Philanthropy at the Western Reserve Historical Society. It's absolutely full. Uh, we're at the end of my performance. Thank you.